third uh, session, uh, talk in this session, and that's by uh, Bree Williams. And so can I just hand over to you to talk about therapeutic jurisprudence in legal education? Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me at Directions in Legal Education for 2020. In my talk today on therapeutic jurisprudence in legal education, um, I hope to explore the ways that we can identify the therapeutic jurisprudence or TJ potential in legal education. May I begin with acknowledging the traditional owners on the land on which I am recording from, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to elders, past, present and emerging in accordance with local law. My thesis research um, that I'm beginning to present uh, to you today investigates how TJ can offer a framework for legal education that will support law academics to pivot to new ways of thinking that align with the co-creators, Wexler and Winnick's objectives of intentional, aware and humane design and application of the law. The example that I'll offer is legal writing, um, not in an attempt to limit it to this uh, skill area, um, but because clear, humanised, non-adversarial styles of legal writing are also effective, persuasive and appropriate for legal practice today. So to begin with, what is TJ? Um, I'm using it here both as a middle range theory and a methodology that seeks to prioritise the evaluation and avoidance of the harmful impact and consequences of the law, legal process and actions of legal actors on the well-being of persons affected by the law. It adopts a flexible and yet a guiding principle that law would better serve society if we study and improve the role of law as therapeutic agent. Legal writing can be thought of as teaching the process of communicating legal thought to a reader. And so a legal's writing can be accepted as a therapeutic agent within an area of laws. A TJ framework in legal education can also enable legal academics to ground their content and approach amidst change by ensuring that a chosen pedagogical approach considers both the design and the application of laws. This would make it a more humanised approach and one that doesn't render um, aspects of the community invisible. So I hope to show how the methodical use of the TJ framework offers a way to enable and ground shifting demands for new content, teaching approaches and diversity of and respect for voice, validation and voluntary participation. These aspects of the law are not soft or lesser in the TJ methodology and they're particularly relevant today. So let us see how the TJ method can, along with satisfying the legal writing learning outcomes, equip institutions and educators to find ways to enhance the voices, validation and voluntary participation of all legal actors. It does that in a way that's interdisciplinary. It's flexible. It's not seeking to be a macro theory that must be followed in a, a, a rigid way to the exclusion of other um, principles of justice. And it does fit within broader comprehensive law and non-adversarial movements. Yamada directs us um, to using the methodology uh, from a first step of adopting um, the breadth and interplay of the factual and legal realities, which can include psychological, social, economic and political conditions that informing our understanding of the situation. We would look firstly to the therapeutic design of law. So we would understand law to include not just the um, rules and doctrine, but also the procedures, including the context and time of the law and structures that relate to um, the creation and administration of that law, as well as the roles, actors and behaviours within an, um, the design of a law, which can be considered um, 
to be the bottle or the um, container for that law that would restrict and allow um, or not allow um, certain therapeutic applications of the law or practices that can be applied um, within that design of law. So that takes us to understanding um, how the application of the law uh, can be evaluated or understood. Amy Ronna points us here to um, one method of doing this, of using the three Vs, the voices, validation and voluntary participation um, of all people, uh, all participants of the law, including legal actors and um, aspects of the community who are affected all participants um, had an opportunity to be heard. Are we in uh, our legal education ensuring that diverse perspectives about the impact of the law um, being included in our uh, content and delivery? And we would take into account an interdisciplinary approach that tells us that there are understandings from areas like psychology and socio-legal um, schools that would inform how our application of the law could be improved and understanding any unintended psychological impact on people affected by the law. And we would need to ensure that there is voluntary participation if we are to assert that we have an effective law um, in an area. And this would take into account whether we are being informed about appropriate application of the law for a wide range of people in the community. And in our understanding of the law, we would uh, be uh, building skills uh, to question any value neutral objectives um, that are dominating an area. So I hope you can see from that methodical approach um, that it's depicting a more humanised approach to teaching, one that prioritises the impact of the law on people that arises from both the design of the law and the application. It's not seeking to reinforce one set of standards, excluding other ways of being and acting. And just as TJ might be an effective means of interpreting and implying standards of excellence in judging, it might also be used um, as a standard of excellence to interpret and prepare teaching and learning approaches from learning outcomes. This is because the learning outcomes that guide the teaching approach for a learning opportunity in a particular setting, something that's uh, shifting often, broadly aim to develop the technical and strategic skills necessary to succeed in law scholarship and practice. This can be enhanced by TJ informing that scholarship so that students can see and practice the skills needed to critique the perceived value neutral nature of legal skills. That analysis and reflection and the skills for doing that can be informed by social science and psychological practices through a theoretical framework that prioritises the therapeutic impact on people in an interdisciplinary way. This departs from a teaching approach that's focused almost entirely on the rules and doctrine lying within the design of the law to the exclusion of both the other aspects of the law and also the application of the law, which is not subjugated um, when using a DJ method. TJ theory informs a teaching approach that's mindful of access to justice and substantive equality issues by moving toward making the entire legal landscape essential knowledge for understanding relevant laws in an area. Legal education theorists like Grimes argue that a combination of informed teaching approaches form a truly integrated approach to teaching and learning, and one that serves those wider agendas of employability, awareness of law in social and commercial contexts, and of issues impacting on social justice. The strategies that have um, informed the legal writing e example that we'll look at um, in a
in a moment. Um, a student, a student-centered approach, preparation of diverse content, the use and design of learning objectives. And the three pedagogical theories that are particularly relevant to this legal education inquiry are cognitive learning theory, constructivist learning theory, and self-regulated theory. In the time, um, I won't um, go into those today, um, but they, um, they are important um, as a foundation for this approach. So each of the, uh, those approaches needs to be considered in the teaching armory and used according to the learning objectives and outcomes sought. And here lies the importance of uh, each legal academic's expertise in an area of law. So the use um, or exclusion of aspects um, of understanding the entire legal landscape um, would be uh, undertaken by the uh, legal expert in that area. So this isn't a call um, to push legal academics beyond what is possible in a crowded curriculum, and uh, but it does allow for a methodical approach to consider uh, has something been left on the shelf or and is there greater diversity and understanding of people um, needed. So the impetus for using the TJ framework to plan and establish any combination of the teaching approaches is that the most grounded, perhaps even at short notice, but it's done in a way that learning objectives and pedagogical approaches continue to focus on both the design of law and the application of law. Law teachers and have a look here at a legal writing education approach. We would begin with learning objectives um, that uh, students have skills at the um, completion that are appropriate, effective, and persuasive. They're able to write in ways that suit um, their intended reader. So they would need to understand both um, the design of the law and any impacts that arise from the application of law and build their skills with that broader understanding of the legal landscape. So this would involve in a consideration of legal academics, taking into account language, context, time, and judicial roles, any understanding of any uh, prioritisation of value neutral ideals when they're considering, considering the rules and doctrine in an area. But they wouldn't exclude the broad range of other uh, aspects of the design of law um, that uh, confine or prevent um, therapeutic application of the law. So we would take into account, are there procedures that are access um, to justice barriers? Um, is advice uh, being enabled um, in a way that is uh, mindful of the needs of their reader? And are we uh, understanding that our practice in an area is affected by the roles that we uh, learn in that could be um, laden with adversarialism, um, the prioritisation of a law and order rhetoric. Are we um, ensuring that early intervention and interdisciplinary advice in relation to that is um, understood um, in, a, in a particular area? Again, um, an assessment made by the legal academic. The skills would then um, always be adapted um, to ensure that the three Vs, um, that any practices and skills learned can be adapted so that they are appropriate and effective, taking into account voice validation and voluntary participation that would vary according to the um, individual needs of people affected by the law. That's something that's very essential. So that's a brief introduction um, to a, a teaching approach uh, planning uh, process. Obviously, it's not um, to the end delivery point, but it would take us um, to uh, a position where we are um, 
producing lawyers who are aware and understanding of the people um, involved in both the design and application of the law. So legal act education, legal writing education in that way can be thought of teaching the process of communicating legal thought to a reader, as I said at the outset. So if it's intimately linked to learning to think and analyse in the legal context, then it's a fitting learning opportunity for therapeutic jurisprudence to inform the teaching method for legal writing. This is because it takes, it requires the highest cognitive legal learning objectives. And in order to craft legal writing in a way that avoid, avoids anti-therapeutic impacts on clients and colleagues, students must have the skills to distill, redefine, create and prioritise all of their information to suit each reader. And if law academics do not have a pedagogical framework that allows them to shift and diversify their learning opportunities, then something might be left on the shelf. We might be rendering some clients invisible, and when graduates seek to problem solve outside of law school, they might have learnt to do that in a way that we replicate client and fellow practitioners invisibility. This anti-therapeutic educational outcome may be dehumanising the practice of law or at least restrict the way that students envisage the law for the remainder of their careers. So I have gone a little over time. I thank you very much uh, for joining me in my Home Among the Gum Trees and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Bree. Um, so, as, as, as before, if there are any questions, please put them in the box. But, um, and I've got some, but I just wonder whether either of our two previous speakers, I, in fact, I can see, so Professor Neuwirth actually is in the box there, but would you like to, Shall I, uh, do you want to say, read your, I can read your question or you could just... I, I can ask it too, if I may, yes. And, no, I wanted to, um, I'm sorry for the selfish question, but I was wondering from previous conversations I had with people involved, especially in dispute resolution, um, whether an oxymoron by putting two opposite um, like positions into one word can be used uh, to help ease the tensions and solve conflicts. Uh, so could they be considered as kind of uh, non-adversarial writing, as you mentioned? Uh, so can they have a positive therapeutic effect or uh, or not? <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Um, I don't know the firm answer to that. What I would um, say is that TJ would say that we need to seek that answer from um, an expert outside of law. Um, Yes, yeah, so that would probably be the extent of my knowledge um, in using that in dispute resolution. Yeah. But uh, am I right in thinking the reason for mentioning that is so you talk in your talk, Bree, you talked about um, kind of hearing different voices, and so I suppose you know that's the tie-in with dispute resolution. Yep, absolutely. So. Um, in relation to dispute resolution, um, the need would be to understand um, the positions that people um, might come into those processes are deeply affected by um, their position um, in a socioeconomic sense, um, but also how um, their dispute has been communicated to them and their access to justice and access to advice in leading up to that, to participating in the process, and that the process itself um, has an impact, and the way it's explained to the participants has an impact on their ability to participate, and also their feeling of whether um, the process itself has validated um, their position in terms of the dispute, but also um, their ability to carry on with. Um, any enforcement um, or rejection of an outcome. I'm not sure if that 
answers your question. Um, can I just uh, ask one of the questions that in the box from Esther uh, things again? Um, there's a lot of emphasis on how law and application could have an impact on people. But what practical knowledge and tools are available to reach that understanding? I think that goes perhaps back to our oxymoron practical tools. So, what, how practically can you, what knowledge and tools could be used to help? I'll read the, I've made a mess. I'll read the question again. There's a lot of emphasis on how law and application could have an impact on people. But what practical knowledge and tools are available to reach that understanding for teachers? students and lawyers? Well, it would depend on the area of law, um, but any sort of experiential learning that has um, authentic access to the real people who are affected, but who are also um, implementing and practicing the law in an area would be the, the most practical tool. Um, but also understanding different viewpoints and uh, understanding different methods of uh, communicating uh, the law to diverse sections of the community um, and understanding different um, views um, and experiences within an area of law um, would all be um, practical uh, ways of understanding and experiencing it. Um, but even just um, diversity in readings in a in a very um, simple way is a way of making sure that students um, read um, and have some experience of seeing the the law from a, a variety of perspectives. So just look in case anybody. Yeah, if I may just. Add, when you say uh, different viewpoints, that's what I meant by referring to paradoxes or because they, they put the most extreme two forms of uh, viewpoints into one, like cold and, and, and hot or, or right and wrong. So um, is that um, my experience, I do use it a lot in, in classrooms, uh, especially paradoxical images, you know, those images where you can see, depending on the angle, you see a horse or a frog or an old woman or a young woman, um, which is used to establish sometimes whether you're more left or right brain centered and, and so on and so forth. I think this, um, in, in my view, helps a lot to enhance uh, the spectrum. And I think every um, conflict between two parties in particular needs to be lifted to a higher level in some way or transcend it. And that, I think, um, helps. But I, I have never thought of um, yeah, it putting it in context with uh, therapeutical jurisprudence. But thank you very much. I suppose you've got to say there's never been a time in recent history when we've had greater need of therapeutic jurisprudence and therapeutic writing than anything that promotes really understanding each other than, than, than the times we're living through right now. I, I, yeah, definitely. I think it also allows us to um, identify um, when we have these shifting pieces um, and pressures to shift, um, for example, all of our uh, teaching online, um, that we have an opportunity to, sh to use a framework to show that certain approaches might be leaving aspects of the law um, out of our um, learning opportunity and that we need to find ways um, to in in increase resources or increase time to make sure that the entire legal landscape is being covered. Great. Bree, well, that's that, that's fantastic. Thank you. And it's been overall a very good discussion and a pleasure to hear all three presentations. Mm -hmm.